Okay, so um, again, wel welcome to this presentation on hacking and ham radio. Uh, Dennis kind of um, introduced the topic properly, which is, yeah, um, hackers kind of get a bad rap uh, most of the day because um, at least the good ones kind of get grouped in with the bad ones, you know, which are the black hat hackers, as we call them. But um, as you'll see, uh, yeah, the uh, was a ham radio operators kind of encompass the true like maker and original hackers, which I'll kind of cover in this presentation. But before that, um, can everyone hear me? Fuck, okay. I think I'm a little inconsistent with the mic. Um, we'll start with the quote. So, those who say it can't be done shouldn't be getting in the way of those doing doing it. So. This is a quote that um, I got really familiar with my last job because I worked for a certain program office and uh, this, uh, this colonel, uh, Bill Grimes, who used to uh, lead the secretive Air Force acquisition program known as Big Safari, uh, said this and he believed that people who were committed to making advanced missions should not be deterred by naysayers and instead should be supported in their endeavors. And, uh, it is important to remember this as we navigate the world of ham radio hacking and technology. So a bit of an overview here of what I'm going to cover tonight. And once again, my call sign is KDATUO and I um, <laughs> have a few pictures of my dog here, of course, which, um, yeah, who, who, who here had uh, met him at the uh, tailgate last, what was it, two weeks ago? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just a, just a fur, fur ball of energy, right? So I um, wanted to start out this talk with, once again, kind of staying focused on the principles, which uh, fortunately, uh, very early on in the, um, what was it, late 2010s, or not 20, uh, late uh, 2000s, actually, like in 2007 or 2008 at DEF CON 16, which I'll talk about DEF CON a bit further, but um, some hackers realized that, oh, we should, we should really get more into ham radio because, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's a it's a forum of experimentation, and it's and technical advancement, which you know, uh, advancing the uh, radio art is kind of describing. And uh, of course, this is this is a quote that even you know seasoned hams, or even in the case of the Flex Radio founder here, um, references the that that actually from the Part ninety seven founding principles, right? So. Yep, so anyways, allow me to introduce myself. So um, I kind of think it's important to kind of recognize uh, kind of where I came from because, right, um, let, let's face it, right, there's not a lot of young people here. I'm surprised that there is actually as much as there are right now. And, uh, and I'm really glad to see that because, you know, consistently, right, I'm usually like the youngest one here that attends the meetings and it's like, okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, so you know, my, my childhood was pretty standard. You know, trains, Legos, computer games. Um, pa parents took me around the U.S. to see, see all the sites and cool things that make this country great. And um, really, the thing that got me into really like, oh, engineering is cool, was the movie Iron Man. And that introduced me to quite a lot of uh, like concepts, which was, oh, man, maybe I should really look into this uh, electrical engineering. And then also, um, hmm, it'd be kind of cool to work in the defense industry. So that, that, that at least uh, planted those ideas early on when I was in middle school. And uh, one day my dad just randomly handed me a soldering gun and just told me, hey, look up vi uh, videos on how to do this. And so I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> and so, um, I was I, I did that for a bit and I was like okay where do I go from here because right there's only so much I can do with that right and I'll, of course um, with a soldering gun you can't really do surface mount components or even like really just even through hole work kind of becomes a little bit of a pain because there's too much heat starts to burn things up but um, <laughs> uh, after a lot of research at the time doing you know re reading wiki articles finding YouTube channels oh. Okay, maybe I should go to Radio Shack and uh, get this uh, introduction or the Electronics Learning Lab, which that is what eventually really, really kickstarted me into tinkering at home. And so, you know, that has the breadboard in the center, uh, springs so that you could quickly and uh, without soldering um, experiment with all sorts of circuits. And uh, the best part about 
the that this particular set are the books that it comes with, which were written by Forrest M. Mims, who is very uh, very big in the hobby electronics space. And uh, um, yep, that's that's at least where I got most of my practical electronics experience. Not really from undergrad, but. Um, Eventually, how I got into ham radio was more or less as a result of uh, just had this one guy on my robotics team that wouldn't stop talking about ham radio. I was like, oh, maybe I should just look into that, right? And saw that, oh, wow, there's lots of DIYing and such. And so decided um, after a chance trip to uh, Fry's Electronics when I was in Georgia with relatives that, oh, I'll pick up these Gordon West books. Let's see what happens. Literally went through the tech book in two days, the general in two days, and then uh, took the exam, I think the Wednesday, so it was like three days in between there, and then, uh, and then passed tech, uh, no, no, no uh, questions missed, and then one missed on general. And uh, the following year decided, oh, let's, let's try uh, extra, right? And uh, passed that, don't remember how many questions I missed, but I know I missed quite a few, so. But um, I look at the extra exam now and it's like, wow, these are like actual like RF interview questions on VNAs and such. So anyways, um, beyond that, like, so my, my career has been mostly focused on hardware security and that's, you know, the, the, kind of the focus here is like hacking and hardware security. I currently am a uh, senior reverse engineer at a company called Cromulence down in New Haven in downtown Melbourne. And uh, one of the biggest things that we do is a competition called HACASAT, which stands for Hack a Satellite. And that's in partnership with the US Air Force and the US Space Force. And uh, in addition to that, I do a little bit of consulting on the side. I've done consulting for various DOD contractors and, and such, and also doing a lot of my own R&D at home. And that's through my company, Hong's Electronics. And uh, yep, there's a picture of my lab. <laughs> Just a fraction of it. It was it was a little too messy to take. I mean, it was the rest of the room is too much of a mess. So, <laughs> and so yep. Here um, and again, uh, if anyone's interested in these slides, uh, please uh, I'll send a like a Google Drive link out on the group on was of the members mailing list. So, anyways, I've been featured in QST once, member spotlight, and then I was in the inaugural issue of On the Air because you know. I've kind of <laughs> am a pretty good example of a younger, or uh, one of the youth hams, right, that really got into it and then actually did a career in engineering. And uh, I've done a few talks on hardware reverse engineering and also a fun one on electronic warfare where I got to fanboy a bit about the EA-18G uh, EA Growler, one of my favorite um, jamming aircraft or electronic warfare aircraft. And uh, ham radio activities, really enjoy QRP and using WSJTX, here's me and Joe Taylor. <laughs> Ham mentioned a while back. And so, anyways, how did I get into this, right? So it was actually an Elmer at DARA, so Dan Amateur Radio Association, that introduced me to this. And I was like, wow, you can actually get paid to take apart hardware? Like, you know, that, that concept really never, like, that always seemed like something that was like kind of out of reach. Where like, oh, like, you know, hacking, you know, you're doing a lot of coding, to develop exploits and such, but as it turns out, um, no, it's actually like very easy to do at home. And uh, like you know, you just start with a couple of Wi-Fi routers, try to figure out where serial is. You get a console because none of that stuff is really ever protected. And so um, that was that was just kind of like how I got into it. But um, also, what kind of got me into eventually, you know, doing talks like this was. Wow, there is actually quite a bit of a relationship between ham radio and hacking. And uh, funnily enough, at this conference, I actually won a um, AWRL handbook in the raffle. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, a bit more backstory. Forgive me if I'm drawing on for this for too long. But um, yeah, so what is DEF CON? It's the largest hacking conference probably in the world. Um, it's like 30,000 plus in Vegas. And it, um, the name comes from, of course, you know, the, the defense readiness condition um, system, right, DEF CON. And uh, it's mostly inspired from the movie War Games, which, you know, that love that movie. It's actually pretty hype, like, you know, looking back on it now, it's like, wow, it's actually pretty, pretty realistic. No wonder uh, there's a story of, like, President Reagan watched it when he was at Camp David, and that's how he ended up signing an executive order on, like, just prepping the DOD on like actual like cybersecurity or at least the concept of it, which is kind of interesting. 
But um, yeah, it's in Vegas because that was like one of the first targets that was in like the movie. It's like, yeah. Um, and so anyways, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, so oh, what was it? Man, no, I'm no, <laughs> going a little too far. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, yeah, so a lot of hackers, at least by now, have kind of talked about ham radio. And so that's now led to uh, things like the DEF CON ham radio village. So villages are kind of just like these spaces at DEF CON where you can um, focus on like a particular topic or whatever and get really hands on with the experts and stuff. And so they've actually been running this for, I want to say, probably like seven years or a little bit more, but uh, they've held the record for. Um, uh, new licenses issued and upgrades in a single day, which is at 205. So, um, only goes to show you that, oh wow, there's quite, quite a bit already that has been contributed by the hacking community by, by doing this. But um, again, back to the perception dilemma, which is, okay, so when you think of hackers, right, especially in the context of ham radio, you think, hmm, pirate radio, you know, people are getting on, the, on our repeater and such, right? you know, blatant FCC violations. And I mean, mo most, most of that's kind of true, right? Because um, that's, they're, they've, they're, they've always kind of existed. And um, uh, what was it? Uh, but yeah, the more positive definition, which is makers, uh, which is, this is more of a uh, new thing within like the last 20 years, but um, hacking, adapting, designing, and creating like something new. And, uh, really right just like figuring out how something works so kind of like the principles of reverse engineering and then repurposing it for your own application and then sharing that which is then open source um but yes uh cyber security which is more of the legitimate kind of hacking for good um is you know more nowadays more important than ever you know critical infrastructure needs to be protected therefore national security and a lot of those rely on the um, with uh, what was it on the back end a lot of RF, which is why uh, it is more important than ever that hams and hackers kind of collaborate. And uh, this was a slide that I used actually uh, previously um, when I was introducing our hacking group in Dayton to Dara, because uh, we had at that time lost uh, our venue to meet at because they went out of business, and so we thought, oh, let's just meet at the clubhouse. <laughs> on Thursdays with the maker group. And so um, one, one thing that uh, I really liked about um, some marketing that I had seen in the early 2010s from AWRL was the, this like flyer that was always handed out, the DIY magic of amateur radio. And you know they were really pointing out that, you know, hams are the original makers and hackers and kind of wish that they keep playing that angle because it is definitely true. But, um, yeah, as far as hackers go, right? Yeah, yeah. The good, yeah. Basically, right. It breaks down to three things, which are the white hat hackers, the black hat hackers, and gray hats. Whites are good, typically legitimate. Hackers are trying to protect against the black hat hackers. Then you have this weird middle ground, which are the gray hat hackers, um, that kind of might sometimes do illegal things, but um, still with you know good, good intentions or such. But uh, they just kind of go into a system without really permission <laughs> and then just kind of report to whatever entity that they're, you know, that they have a vulnerability in. So, um, let's see. And then yes, uh, some other definitions like pen testing and then uh, APTs. So pen testing, which I'm gonna use quite a bit in this presentation is the method in which, um, oh wait, but why was my vision getting blurry? Um, <laughs> Uh, evaluating a security of system network or application by simulating an attack from a malicious actor. And um, most of the time that's white hat hackers that are doing that so that they could keep and find the things that black hat hackers are getting into or even gray hats. And then uh, APTs are kind of an extension of black hat hackers in that these are like actual like nation states and big companies that um, the biggest example I can definitely give you these days is ransomware is definitely one of those things where it's like an advanced persistent threat level kind of group that's doing that. And uh, recently had a friend last, or yeah, like last week literally, uh, their company got compromised from ransomware and their defense contractor also. And so, 
yeah. And uh, I was I was like telling them like, look, just tell your IT what happened, right? It's probably not you're not your fault because it only takes one person to in this case download a malicious PDF that's actually dis disguised as executable. And, you know, it just takes one person to run that. And like this particular ransomware is quite insidious in that it can shut down antivirus and then kind of pretend to be like a legitimate program. And then through that, it just then locks down all the files and then, you know, asks for in this case, like a one to $8 million ransom. So um, I, just, I just kept telling them, look, I hope your company kept good uh, backups, but beyond that, it's completely out of your hands. Like just, uh, if they got your like personal information, I highly recommend like a credit freeze, you know, right? The standard identity protection, hopefully your company will reimburse you for it because it's kind of on them. Anyways, uh, this is just an infographic that I left in here, basically describing the, po the previous points about the different hackers, but in more graphical format. And uh, now we're gonna talk about some software-defined radio stuff, which, um, so uh, in my research of this particular topic, uh, and again, surprisingly, there is not a clear like timeline of how SDR came into development. So, right, it's like, yeah, maybe I could be the one to actually curate this history, but um, uh, some say that it's origins, right, or the really concept of SDR originally in the 70s, from the military, like most things. Um, and uh, it was really until Joseph Matola III, the third, uh, who actually, fun fact, used to work here in the 90s at Harris, surprise, um, that he kind of coined the term software-defined radio and that it's a flexible, uh, programmable to accommodate various physical area formats, so like, you know, like mixers, filters, all that, and then also protocols, so like demodulating and such. And um, was I think the first ham radio SDR is kind of uh, credited to uh, the founder of Flex Radio Systems and then his groundbreaking uh, uh, series in QEX, a software defined radio for the masses, which I've linked down there. And then um, then uh, in the commercial space and again the ham radio space. But funnily enough, every one of these guys is they're all hams. So <laughs> that that kind of tells you already that oh. Ham, hams have always been on the cutting edge, and we, I mean, we still are. So, um, yeah, you have uh, now Matt Edis in 2005 and also Philip Covington with HPSDR. And um, I'm very familiar with the Edis radios because they're uh, very, they're, they're the, the ones that are best supported by GNU Radio, and, uh, but they're, they cost a lot, unfortunately. They're like, in some cases, as much as a actual ham radio rig. But um, yeah, nowadays in the present, I mean, it's kind of overwhelming to see like now this list, right? You have not only just all these open source projects, but also the, the, bi the big mainstream vendors got, all got into it now. And you know what, you look at what uh, the Sherwood Engineering receiver like list, like all of them are now like these, like uh, all was from the big brands, especially all the uh, FPGA plus whatever ADC and DAC combo put into a box. But uh, they, I mean, that, that combo works really well. But um, factors to consider when choosing any of these SDRs are frequency range, bandwidth, sensitivity, dynamic range, and of course, cost. So uh, of course, one of the biggest breakthroughs probably in SDR or just really uh, getting it to the masses, right? Because what, uh, even despite uh, Flex Radio existing and all these other efforts, um, I think the price never really got below a hundred bucks even. And of course the real breakthrough, which I kind of, kind of hits home close to home for me because this is how I kind of got started was the RTL SDR, which is the true definition of a hack because um, specifically this uh, team that uh, eventually created a project called Osmocom um, created a driver for the, uh, these you know, commodity uh, DVB-T USB dongles that you know I would uh, uh, normally used in like Europe for uh, TV and stuff, but um, they were, they figured out that oh like you know after looking at all the USB packets that are going back and forth between a computer and the dongle that oh wow there's IQ samples here that we can actually use to push to a uh, program right and then display it on you know waterfall or or whatever program right and. Uh, 
that that was you know what 2012 really groundbreaking less than, at the time less than ten dollars unfortunately because of the chip shortage and other factors they're like now like in sometimes thirty dollar range for the good ones but now you know we've gotten to the point now where <laughs> you could buy f uh, five of them in uh, that are phase coherent so that you could do cool stuff like direction finding or fox hunting um, I think uh, I'm trying to remember I think someone uh, at one point in this group uh, emailed a video of uh, using the Kraken SDR to find, uh, what was it, people getting on a repeater? Yeah, some, some, some pirate radio operators. So yeah, that, that, that happens to be this right here. But um, so as it turns out, I mean, you still can get these for less than 10 bucks. Well, I think the AliExpress listing here is 842, but um, yeah, it, the, I highly recommend the RTL SDR blog, uh, uh, blog dongle just because it has a high precision oscillator and stuff that doesn't drift as much. And then it has all the optimizations. Like, you know, they actually built it so that it could be a receiver for the whole range from like HF to 1.7 gigahertz. Um, you know, I've, I bought most of their stuff over the years and it's, I, I can't complain. And uh, they apparently have a two year warranty on these, so. It's kind of nice, and uh, but no, this group was not finished. They made a uh, an, they they did another hack on these uh, very curiously USB to uh, VGA adapters that uh, happen to have these chips that you could uh, stream directly from a host computer instead of like there being actually like, like like a buffer or like a frame buffer on the chip, and. Um, Literally using the RGB channels on VGA, they created a, a transmitter with that, basically, and they can transmit things from you know, very complex waveforms like GSF and even GPS. And with all the harmonics, apparently GPS is like the eleventh harmonic that they could transmit on. So, but um, it's it's pretty incredible because right, it's like uh, all said and done, you can you can with like between the RTL SDR and this, you know, well like tw 20, 30 bucks and it's all software defined. It's pretty cool. And yep, there's, this is allegedly one that is on Amazon. It's, you don't really know until um, you get it, but I did, I did see on the listing that it lists uh, the Fresco Logic 2000, FL2000 driver, so that means that it's probably it. And uh, um, people have already made boards around this, but like a basic setup, like as you can see, where VGA broken out to BNC, and you get RF out. But um, now, uh, going into now GNU Radio, which is the heart of how a lot of these work, or at least now you can build your own radios, um, is a very, very powerful and flexible toolkit that uh, enables users to design and build software-defined radios and signal processing systems. And one key benefit is, is that it's hardware agnostic, or at least they try to make it so that uh, if you port something from an RTL SDR, it'll work on, let's say, um, an Edis radio, right? So, so, you know, just upgrading hardware, but the software still stays the same. And uh, most importantly, it is free and open source. And uh, it has the largest and active community of developers, like just for, I mean, because well, like um, many stakeholders, including the defense industry and of course our community, they, they, they all use this. And uh, here's an example of actually a single sideband transceiver in GNU Radio. And again, it's most of the time for at least a lot of ham radio stuff, you rarely ever have to get into the nitty gritty of C++ and Python. But at least nowadays, that's a lot e easier than it used to be to make custom blocks. But um, this, this is like a prime example that I think a lot of people would be interested in and uh, have the link here below. And um, yeah, so. Now, on the, of course, there's all sorts of parallel efforts over time now that have gotten open sourced from our defense community and intelligence community. And uh, one of them is the NSA Red Hawk SDR software and framework. And uh, very similar to um, the GNU Radio project, but it has a few differences in that uh, they purposed it so that it could be distributed across different computers or many computers so that you could actually use um, like, you know, like a Raspberry Pi cluster to process all the data or um, a bunch, like, you know, basically a supercomputer, right? Because um, I mean, what could imagine how intensive uh, SIGINT is, right? 
especially these days. And uh, it's also just like a new radio feature is a GUI that has the blocks, which I actually have the picture of here. And uh, in this case, I think it's just like a FM radio decoder that they have in the example. And um, uh, let's see what else there is. I know that there exists a chain between Red Hawk and GNU Radio where you can hook it up, but that's not very well supported at this point, which I was kind of surprised by. So um, just know that this exists, but um, uh, support might be a little uh, <laughs> non-existent at the moment, at least publicly. And so um, with all this, right, what, why, why, why are hackers really interested in ham radio at all or just right with RF? And uh, the primary application ends up being it's the ISM bands, right? The industrial scientific medical, um, like the, uh, uh, what was it, frequency allocations. So like, you know what, you have Wi-Fi on there, yeah, what, like 2.4 and five gigahertz. And then even Bluetooth like, are all technically ISM devices. And uh, uh, what is of prime interest to actually a lot of hackers is really the, um, the first two that I've kind of like highlighted in the green box, which is the 70 centimeter band and then the 30 centimeter band, because there's a lot of ICS and like critical infrastructure that runs on those frequencies, or at least they monitor and control. And um, Unfortunately, um, as, as we've seen now, uh, a lot of those are unencrypted. So, um, oh yeah, and going back to this, uh, one of the reasons why the HackRF exists is because it covers, as you can see, conveniently all these frequencies up to six gigahertz. Because beyond six gigahertz, stuff gets very expensive, as I've learned over time. It's almost, sometimes it's almost unobtainium for a hobbyist. <laughs> Except for the, the, the really cool uh, hams that do all the really extreme microwave stuff, as I would call it. But um, yeah, so yeah, HackRF. And then, uh, yep, so it's ICS, critical infrastructure and utilities. They all use sub gigahertz frequencies one way or another for monitoring, command and control. And uh, unfortunately, if they don't add any security at all, that can lead to unauthorized access and you know really, really bad things. I think, uh, what was it? In Florida, there was the water treatment plant that got hacked a few years ago. And I believe one of the attack vectors there might have been through RF. <laughs> so, yep. And um, again, uh, one, one of the cool things about the hacking community is, is that their endless resourcefulness and also finding um, really interesting hacks using uh, things that don't seem like, wait, what? They, they used a, a toy to make a uh, spectrum analyzer in a sub gigahertz tool. Yes, that, that's, that's this right here. <laughs> the IM me from, um, I thought it was Mattel, but I guess this, they, they eventually got bought out by Mattel. But um, yeah, that, that eventually turned into a whole full blown project called the Yardstick. So yet, yet another radio dongle by Great Scott Gadgets, who at, at the time when they made this, they were the soon-to-be creators of the HackRF. And uh, this was like probably one of their first big hits because it's like, wow. With, for what, like I think for like 100 bucks, I can uh, do all these uh, really, you know, sub gigahertz frequencies that ICS and critical infrastructure use. And uh, yep, there's a link to that data sheet on that pretty awesome Texas Instruments part. And now, so uh, one recent trend, I don't know if anyone here is familiar, especially if anyone watches the Ham Radio Crash Course, which I was surprised to see cover this, but um, the Flipper Zero, which is this, uh, if anyone remembers, maybe their kids or grandkids having a Tamagotchi, it's like that, but with uh, like a bunch of hacking tools loaded into it. So like a uh, similar sub gigahertz transceiver, if not, I think it's literally also the TI uh, chip that's also in there. And um, yep, as you can see here, uh, controlling a gate <laughs> to open. Yeah, so like, you know, you wait for, um, like the scenario there is, is that you wait for someone to open the gate with their car and then you record the RF transmissions during that time and then you, re you re replay it back. And uh, that's actually what is known as a replay attack. <coughs> And um, not the best comparison, but um, yeah, the blue box uh, 
it kind of, th this whole thing kind of reminded me of you know the really really early days of hacking. Um, while it's not a perfect comparison, there are some similar similarities here in that this is technically right. I mean. I mean, really, right? The, the the blue box was pretty illegal to use to unlock uh, long distance calls, but um, it you know it still requires a bit of technical knowledge and expertise to use effectively. But um, you know, with the core purpose uh, to manipulate and exploit technology, but in different ways. And uh, of course, um, as you can see in this picture, this is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And before they created Apple, of course, they were best friends from childhood. But uh, they, they for a while, were selling uh, blue boxes. <laughs> that one was known as Freaking? Yes, yeah. and that is known as uh, yeah, Freaking, which is not as much of a term that is used anymore, surprisingly. Like, I, I, um, I mean, like I know that people will still use the term, but I'm surprised that people don't use it as much because right, it just means like you're like an expert in something that like particular tech. And so, um, yeah, this is like the pretty comprehensive list of uh, functions supported by the Flipper Zero. So, as I mentioned, like the prime application which interests hams and hardware security experts alike is the uh, RF sniffing and emulation. Capability, so they, the ability to identify uh, which frequencies are being used, recording them, and then also replaying them to do interesting things for education purposes. <laughs> Legal disclaimer. And um, uh, one thing that uh, actually one of my coworkers who actually has the Flipper Zero uh, cloned our, our uh, corporate ID badges, and that's how he. And so, you know, if, I, if he forgets his uh, badge that day, he just uses a flipper zero. Um, fortunately, our security was a little forgiving on that one, but I, I would not do that myself because it's like, hmm, that's... <laughs> Maybe, right? Yeah. But that, that does show how, right, like, it's very critical to... Um, Maybe we should upgrade all these NFC and RFID systems if they're kind of vulnerable to something that's very attainable, right? Um, like was uh, nowadays, I mean, uh, right now they're kind of in a weird spot because um, for some reason they're not selling in the US right now. I don't know why. Um, other than like they had like a, um, a shipment of them got seized from customs. And then um, I think it was, I think it was like almost like a few millions worth of units. And so they, they kind of got a little bitter about that. But um, I don't, I don't know if it's either because of that or because of there's actually like now some um, uh, was uh, the authorities are now really looking into it because I mean pe people have now made uh, what was it um, like well, uh, the infrared repeaters to uh, bypass traffic lights and stuff with it which is you know very super illegal um, if I recall from some of my history I think uh, President Bush back in the early 2000s signed the federal law to prohibit that with, you know, it's basically a felony, so. You can still buy it on Amazon. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah, but for a very inflated price. Because <laughs> I think they're retail 170. Um, I actually sold one at Hamcation um, to, a, to a lucky ham that was able to, to, I mean, that just like saw it and I was like, oh yeah, I, I have one. You, you can buy it, it's available. Because <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're a little hard to get otherwise right now, other than paying what, like 50, 50 or almost 100 bucks over sticker price. But um, yeah, going, going into some more interesting, wait, did someone call my name? <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, yeah, so one of the other cool things you could do with the RTL SDR dongles and all the derivatives is there's a cool software suite called Tempest SDR which is actually a software suite that can reconstruct images over um, video cables. So right, the, the whole, and it's of course called Tempest SDR because uh, there's the whole, you know, um, Tempest DOD and NSA requirements and certifications that that's what's mostly named after because most of those uh, standards and certifications are uh, in place or those standards exist to per to prevent stuff like this uh, from happening, from uh, bridging the air gap, so to speak. But you know, every, every electronic device, whether we like it or not, emanates some sort of RF. Um, I mean, it's, it's incredible like nowadays how, wow, we have CPUs and RAM that's like basically in microwave frequencies and so all that stuff emanates. 
Um, I mean, I've seen people uh, conduct uh, reading RAM with SDR, actually, before. And uh, it's pretty scary because it's like, hmm, yeah, that's especially now that right uh, more and more SDRs have become a lot more accessible and cheaper that's like a very very real attack vector and yep here's here's yeah so, uh, same example different picture and like you know, they're able to read this text off the screen with the SDR and so now we're gonna get into the hardware hacking toolbox for ham radio I think we're still good on time um, so right uh, one, one of the key uh, big pushes from um, the maker community has been the concept of open source hardware. Uh, interestingly enough, I think uh, the ham radio operators kind of uh, actually what was it? standardized this first with uh, ta the Tapper open hardware license, um, which is actually the Open Source Hardware Association kind of referenced that for the now standard uh, open source hardware um, licensing. And uh, of course, not going to read this whole slide, but um, as, as we've known over the years as a result of the maker movement, uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone are like the, it was, I mean, such groundbreaking open source hardware projects that we all kind of now take for granted. And um, yeah, I, I, I had some fun making these slides. And uh, the unsung hero of, uh, of open source hardware and ham radio DIY is just the simple Silicon Labs slash Skyworks clock generator that somehow has made its way into, um, let's see in this list, uh, VFOs, um, just a general clock source for LOs, and then uh, it's also in the nano VNA, so it's the main clock that drives everything. And then it's in countless DIY and homebrew uh, radio projects, because again, it's it's able to go from, what is it, nine, uh, what is it, uh, 11 or 8 kilohertz to uh, 160 megahertz, at least the ones that are uh, widely sold. I think the newer ones, so that might be like the C or B models, are like 1 kilohertz to 200 megahertz. And so uh, that is something where, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think when they released this chip that they had the intention of it being used as a VFO or such, right? Because it was really meant to be just like replacing crystals for clocks on microcontrollers and processors. Um, I, st I, I, in fact, still use it for that, um, for all sorts of applications, because uh, the vendor tool, in addition to the amazing tutorial and library for the Arduino IDE from Adafruit, makes this very easy to implement in like almost anything. And that's why there's, there's so many projects that use it. And um, another driving factor is, and also in the, hard, in the hardware hacking toolbox, is KiCAD slash KeyCAD. Um, cho choose a side on how you want to pronounce it. Is it, is it Kai CAD or Key CAD? And um, yes, this, this is a very powerful electronic design automation suite that uh, I know that a lot of ham radio projects have started to move to it. Uh, most of the open source hardware communities moved to it since um, the, the old guard, so to speak, like Eagle CAD, which then got bought out by Autodesk. Um, is still pretty limited in the free version, if not a little bit more limited than it used to be. So there was a big push to um, quickly develop this into a much more capable software, and it has over the last like seven years, I want to say. They're like on version seven or eight now, and it's pretty awesome. And they have amazing RF tools, which um, again, so here's some just some screenshots from the software. This is schematic capture layout. And um, the actual like board viewer, as well as yeah, and here's the uh, one of the examples from the RF tool kit for KiCad. And uh, another f uh, sp suite of software that kind of uh, nicely merges or not merges uh, nicely works with uh, KiCad is uh, Quark Studio, which actually stands for Quite Universal Circuit Simulator. And um, this was like a fork of the, that, and it's now Quark Studio, which uh, actually has uh, very, very nice RF and microwave tools and uh, simulation and modeling. And so people have made you know, the, the classic hairpin filter that we know we, we look at it, it's like, man, how does this work? They're, they're, they're not connected. <laughs> Wait, is it a capacitor <laughs> across those, those lines? Yeah. 
So you, you, know, you could do really exotic stuff like that, stuff that at one point, you know, either the learning curve was really, really high to learn free tools or you paid you know, thousands of dollars for like Keysight, uh, ADS, or some, like what was it? Um, yeah, all the, all the EM software. And uh, another very important skill in the hardware hacking toolbox is hardware reverse engineering, which is a core competency, competency of mine, which is the disassembly of analysis and analysis of components and circuitry on, on like, you know, board or a system. And then uh, something that I do almost like regularly now is extracting and dumping firmware of memory chips, anything that holds memory. Yep, that's, that's what I do most of the time. And uh, you know, some, some components, right, these are all surface mount components or BGA components. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very steep learning curve to do uh, BGA rework. But uh, once, once you get it, it's, once you develop or at least find a nice uh, reflow curve or kind of manually do one, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, but yeah, you know, we've seen reverse engineering with, with ham radio stuff like all the time. This is just a slide from a previous talk I talked about why, like why hard, hard, hardware are you in general. But um, yeah, so with the advent of FPGAs, which also very, very big open source efforts by hackers and reverse engineers, to bring this to the open source community. And uh, the reason why this is such a huge deal is because um, FPGAs have um, not only just right logic gates or the ability to uh, behaviorally um, act like logic gates through lookup tables and such or other advanced logic functions, but uh, with things called DSP slices, which are basically multipliers, which FFTs need. Um, that, that is a very, very big development, and uh, I, I'm very excited to see where a lot of DIY ham radio projects take that. And um, on the horizon, of course, is the RF SOC, which is still like tens of thousands of dollars, but uh, imagine having 16 RX and TX channels with multi gigabit per, uh, uh, what was it, giga sample per second rates, and so, you know, oversample HF, see all of it at the same time, decode all, uh, all at the same time. Imagine just having like windows of uh, WSJTX running on each band. And um, yep, another thing in the toolbox that I've, you know, hard hardware hackers use, reverse engineers use, the biggest development in the last five years is uh, NSA's Ghidra, which um, at one point was very, 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 very classified. But uh, fortunately it's free because it's paid by taxpayer dollars. And uh, it's designed to analyze and understand compiled executables. Originally, it was developed for analyzing malware and such. And um, the other part of why it was developed was because the only other alternative is Ida Pro, which is a uh, company, uh, the company Hexrays, which is actually based in Belgium, is something that we didn't want to be reliant on. I exactly right. So. You know, why, why, don't we make, we, why, why don't we make our own tool here in the US, right? And so that's what the NSA basically did. Um, hilariously enough, and actually coincidentally enough, then companies like, um, or was it, is it in, I guess it's in the, no. Uh, oh, it's in my notes, but um, there's a company actually not uh, too far from here in downtown Melbourne called Vector35, and they uh, made a software called Binary Ninja. And that is also another alternative from the very expensive tools like Ida Pro, which you have to pay thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars per processor module and architecture to even remotely understand what's going on. So um, here's kind of like, this is Ghidra specifically, but this is like, okay, so I can see assembly code, the uh, decompiled code. So basically this to uh, C, C++ pseudocode, and then uh, function graphs kind of seeing how the code flows. And um, most of the time, because you know, I'm not that like, so like an expert in software at all. Just looking at strings, so here, this is a talk I did last fall on uh, certain IoT devices and you know, you know, you just catch things like, oh, the baud rate is just stored in the strings and stuff for serial, or you, know, you see like the IP addresses, they're all set by default. 
And sometimes that's, that's all it is. Like, like, like that's how I use it most of the time is just looking for strings. Um, and most of the time that's a, is, is a sanity check for determining whether or not I get, got a good memory dump because like, a lot of things can happen. But um, uh, as you can see already over the years, um, there, there have been countless, this is just a few samples, but uh, reverse engineering efforts on radios to uh, it was a, uh, jailbreak the firmware, so basically gain full access over it to then customize all sorts of features. Yes. Uh, the, fir the first, I think, high profile one was actually the uh, MD380, which is this DMR radio. And uh, there's, there's a really cool tutorial of how they went through that with just Ghidra, because originally it was like this one was done with Ida, but you know, that's not accessible to everybody. And then most recently, uh, the Radio Oddity GD77. I think that's another DMR radio. I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that into DMR, but. <laughs> Yes, so anyways, let's talk about now the future of ham radio, right? Is, is it hackers? Is it, I mean, like, what, 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 what are, where are we going? Um, now, the one thing I've seen over the years now, right, is, you know, when, we're, when we talk about attracting youth into the hobby, right, like, there is one thing that kind of remains, and that is that the youth are definitely interested in doing things with computers, if not very interesting things, right? So, I mean... P PC building is still very popular thanks to Linus Tech Tips and other various channels on YouTube and all the other social media outlets. Um, and then uh, video game modding and cheating and hacking and stuff, that, that's always existed. And surprisingly, some of the best software versus engineers I know started that way. Like, you know, you're literally looking at the hex code, editing it live, and then, you know, enabling all sorts of features or trying to get um, an advantage over your opponent in some kinds of games, right? And then, of course, you know, like, like, like myself, right, you know, right, I want to say that there's probably a lot of us here that probably as kids started tearing apart, you know, whatever you could get your hands on, right? And so there's always that general curiosity about how does this work, right? What's, what's inside? How, how does this work? What, what are these, like, components in here or these things, right? And so um, kind of, right, like, the, the future of ham radio definitely looks bright. Like, I mean, people always say it's dying, but it's not. <laughs> because we're always on the cutting edge, right? Like, as you saw on the list of like, even bringing ham I mean, uh, SDR to the forefront, to the commercial space. Um, I mean, those, those are all hams. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, very enthusiastic about specifically like the open source FPGA tool chains and RF, uh, SOC technology, so our system on a chip technology, like that Xilinx board I, I talked about, um, are making that more accessible to hobbyists and enthusiasts. And then um, just like how I edited most of this presentation, surprisingly I didn't read off most of the script, uh, uh, chat, things like ChatGPT are just like revolutionizing the way we um, think about content, consume content, generate content. So there, there's, there's that. And then um, not to get all buzzwordy, but yeah, I, man, it kind of hurt that chat GPT generated this for me, but like, yeah, I guess you could use blockchain for stuff. I mean, maybe you could use it to check logs, right? I mean, I mean, right, do, do people really cheat in ham radio <laughs> on contesting? I've, I've heard it happens, but I, I don't know. But um, yeah, amateur radio operators have, I mean, right, this, this long history um, way of contributing to the advancement of the radio art. And, you know, hackers and makers have always been part of this picture and still continue to play a role in this. And um, I think by, right, continuing to foster this culture of innovation, experimentation, and collaboration between hackers and makers and radio amateurs of all ages, we can ensure that the radio art continues to. Uh, thrive and evolve in the years to come. Let us continue to explore, experiment, and create and inspire the next generation of radio enthusiasts to carry on traditions and values of amateur radio. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> and uh, I have so, so many links. I mean, like you probably saw on every slide, there's links everywhere. So it's, it's very overwhelming, this presentation, I know. <laughs>